Thank you so much for joining us for this debate on a call for accountability. And we are joined by Bonang Mahali, who is the president of Business Unity South Africa. Tim Cohen is the editor of Business Maverick. Megan Padigadu, who is the chief financial officer of EOH, and Fatima Newman, chief risk officer at EOH. And Bahang, I think this is a timely discussion as we kick off 2022, having just uh, seen the state capture report really coming to fruition, being published. The the naming and the shaming is happening, so to speak. But now it's all about accountability and and where we go from here. Of course, our track record in South Africa isn't exactly in favor of basically demonstrating that people will be held accountable for wrongdoing. Bonang, I'm going to get you to come in here and, and give me your thoughts as we begin this discussion. Bronwyn and to my colleagues, thank you so much for having me. Precisely because the Zondo Commission report has a few choice things to say about companies such as NetBank, Standard Bank, PwC, and others. And that government should examine all contracts with Bain and company with a view to enable the NPA to prosecute the more than 1,400 named individuals. This report that is 874 pages long, that's why as BUSA, we met and resolved a number of things that, firstly, I think as business, we need to be the ones that demonstrate beyond any shadow of doubt that we'll act with agency, with purpose, to ensure that our very own members that have been mentioned are indeed charged, convicted, sentenced, and serve time. That is precisely why the first resolution we took was because we understand how state capture works and is to hollow out the state institutions, especially the NPA, we're going to do the capacity building ourselves. We're going to second some of our skilled people, some of our members, Edward Nathan Sotnenberg, uh, Bowman, Gilfillan and Associates, Waxmans, their own hours to make sure that this is done this year. We don't have to wait another year. We decided that we are going to bolster the initiatives of our 55 member organizations in creating an integrity fund because we want to have both an outsized and oversized impact in going after those people that have been implicated. We said we want to do this because it's manifestly in our interest, not just because we are good corporate citizens, but to restore businesses' reputation, integrity, and credibility, and thereby regain businesses' social license to operate. We also said we are going to call upon our member organization to bring in these individual companies that have been named to account tell us what they know, what they did, to demonstrate that they are remorseful, they are contrite, because contrition is an ongoing process. Lastly, Broadman, we also said we support the many initiatives that are articulated in the report, like the rewarding of whistleblowers. Not just throw money at them, but let's employ them in our own companies to negate the narrative that says, if you open your big mouth, you'll starve to death. That we support the overarching recommendations that a national charter against corruption be adopted by government, business, labor, and other stakeholders. That an independent public procurement anti-corruption agency, including a council, inspectorate, litigation unit, tribunal, and the Court of Appeal be established. We do this because we want to restore the institutions of the criminal justice system, including the police and the prosecution uh, agency. This must be music to the ears of the likes of Fatima Newman and, and Megan Padigadu, who have walked very hard yards in 
uh, cleaning up EOH to the EOH of today and are very much looking for that accountability from those that were found guilty of wrongdoing. Fatima, with Business Unity South Africa taking such an active position in that call for accountability and holding to account, it's going to make your life a lot easier, isn't it? Oh, no, no, I, I agree, and, and Bonang, thank you, thank you for that. Um, I think between myself, Megan, and, and the leadership of, of EOH, we've probably been waiting for, for some call to action for, for the better part of the last three years. Um, and, you know, you, you talk about some of the recommendations specifically that were set out in the, in the Zondo Commission report. These things exist in, in, in countries like the US, the UK, Canada, etc., um, and, and they've been there for, for, for several years, right? And from a deferred prosecution agreement perspective in particular, this holds many, many um, benefits for, for organization. And coming out of financial services and banking in particular, we saw deferred prosecution agreements um, being run very successfully over time. So if I, if I look at what, what EOH has done and why that is beneficial in terms of that specific recommendation specifically, um, I think it allows corporates to make full reparation in terms of what you've done. Um, there's a very transparent um, element to it. So you come clean, you come forward, and, and there's a very clear plan on the back of that of what you need to do, how you rebuild trust, how you rebuild trust with your, your stakeholders in terms of customers, internal stakeholders, shareholders, etc. The conduct goes under a particular spotlight where that gets articulated and, and that gets interrogated. We agree as stakeholders holistically what we want going forward and what we don't. So, so the trust element and the deficit certainly gets worked on. That builds a very strong accountability piece of what people are looking for. So we know what you've done, we know what we don't like, and we know very clearly what we're going to do as a consequence of that. Two deferred prosecution agreements. It also takes away very lengthy and very costly um, legal battles that often gets protracted for years and years. People fall out the system. They go off, they start new organizations, and the same practices and behavior continues. I, I think the biggest thing um, that we encountered walking into EOH um, is the culture that sits within an organization that allows this type of corruption to take place. Um, and when we first started off, I think one of the big realizations for us is that you really have to, you can put whatever policies and procedures in place, but if you don't, you know, tap into people's hearts and really change how they feel and um, what they do about things, it really then becomes a tick box exercise. So you have to change the hearts and minds of people um, and that's really what we've tried to do within EOH from a values perspective in terms of what we stand for um, doing doing business in an ethical and in, in integral way and also being courageous to stand up because I think what's happened in South Africa has been that there have been too few people um, standing up and saying this is not right. Too many people have been happy to turn a blind eye and look the other way um, while this has happened within our country. Before I go to Tim and uh, bring Tim into the discussion on the recent article that, that he has penned uh, with regards to Tongart Hewlett, which really mirrors many of the elements that we're hearing from the EOH story. Bonang Business Unity South Africa, uh, the collective, has been watching the EOH movie so to speak, in, in motion, this transformation of the organization. What are your thoughts as you've seen the headlines over the last two years and ultimately now that move to call those that were guilty of wrongdoing to account? Sad, tragic and regrettable because now the whole of business is tarred with the same black brush. From the days of Steinhoff, Tongat Hewlett, SAP, McKinsey, the list is long, and yet nobody is in orange overalls, thereby sending a message that says crime pays. So this 15th Commission of Inquiry report cannot be like any other. That is why we are going to do everything in our power to make sure that not in another five years, but this year, 
all of us redouble our efforts and we do what's in the best interest of South Africa for the South Africa of Khalifa Nelson Mandela's dreams, the South Africa that all of us have been praying for. As I end, Bronwyn, remember that when I was running BLSA, we started the Integrity Fund, we started the Integrity Pledge, six commitments as to how businesses are going to behave, launched in Alexander, not in Centen. And the very first company of the four that we suspended within the first year didn't come from the public sector, but KPMG, then, of course, ESCOM and Transnet and Bain, precisely because you see, we need to be the custodians of uniformity and cons consistency. Our constitution is the best in the world, precisely because there's that component that speaks about equality before the law, irrespective of your proximity, of your office, of your prominence, or your political connections. Thanks, Bronwyn. Tim, as editor of Business Maverick, uh, I think everybody is celebrating the article that uh, you have put to paper, of course, and, and that being uh, the story around Tongart Hewlett and the fact that 450 million rand is being claimed from the ex-executives, so to speak. Take us through the, the story and, and perhaps get those touch points that mirror what we're seeing from the new EOH executive. In 2019, Tongart announced that uh, it was conceivable that they had misstated their financial res uh, um, results. PwC did, a, did an investigation and found it that, in fact, they had. Um, Tongart's share price, in the meanwhile, just absolutely imploded. All of the made execs were booted. Quite similar to what happened at EOH, actually. The results were restated. In Tongart's case, they were fined both by the FSCA and also by the JSE. But the intersection with EOH is that there's now a civil claim brought by Tongart against its former management. Similar in, in style, I think, to the to the the one that EOH has brought against its former management. And actually, you know, you, you, you were talking about what, uh, about the deferred prosecution agreements. In a sense, what what the Zonda Commission ha has discovered for us, the level of wrongdoing, for both in the public and the private sector, has completely overwhelmed the prosecuting authority. The most important thing that we are struggling with as a as a as a country, and uh, you know, deferred prosecution agreements are are in a sense a way of trying to speed the process, trying to to bring justice. At the same time, there is a risk involved. Prosecutors decide on a, on a settlement themselves. You, you're necessarily giving up what you might possibly win as a prosecutor when you do that. And, you know, deferred prosecution agreements might have the same effect. But the civil actions um, are, are, are a very interesting aspect of this uh, because they have now been brought in, in the EOH's case and in Tongard's case and also, of course, in the Steinoff case. And uh, it's possible that they m may have a more deterrent effect than the much longer and much more onerous uh, process of, uh, of criminal prosecution. Are you seeing the appropriate action from the regulators? So, so I think that's probably been our biggest disappointment. And our story is a very, very similar story um, to Tonga Tulet. I think because of the, the, the corruption that happened within EOH, it's probably lesser known that um, we also had to restate our accounts and th there was also financial fraud effectively in terms of overstated balance sheets and that. Um, and we ended up having uh, fines imposed on us um, and it's always the legal entity that has the fine imposed on it, but it isn't legal entities who are the ones who are perpetuating the corruption and the bribery, it's actually individuals. And we've seen very little in terms of you know, the individuals behind the company at the time um, being pursued. We've had very little engagement from regulatory bodies, um, from both professional type of bodies in terms of taking it forward. I think too often, um, you know, regulatory bodies don't want to put themselves out there and they'd rather wait to have uh, the courts find something before they do anything. And I think we need to get away from that. We need to see far more proactivity from regulatory bodies, from our professional bodies within South Africa. And I also do think the regulatory bodies need to have far more teeth in terms of how they do things. Um, if I just look at um, the, the United States in terms of their um, listed environment and how it works, 
they have exchanges, be it NASDAQ, be it the New York Stock Exchange, but they have a separate um, um, SEC, the Security um, Exchange and Control um, Regulatory Body that is separate from those exchanges and is able to ensure that companies operate to a certain level and there's no conflict that arises as a result of separating those out. I think those are some of the things from a South African perspective we really need to look at, um, and especially if we want to re restore investor con confidence and people investing in South Africa on our exchanges, we need to be thinking about that too. Bonang, let me get you in here because it, it is a quandary for me, and that is the fact that the legal entity gets fined ultimately when it's in turnaround, you've got new management teams, you are punishing the very people that are turning the company around rather than, in all of these cases, the old guard who were found guilty of wrongdoing. It just doesn't make sense to me. Does it make sense to you, Bonang? I agree with Megan and team, but let me add by saying it's both end together at the same time, not either or. So when you expel a company as a member of your organization, it has a laser focus by the country on what is it that this country has done. It has a deleterious effect on its operations, on its shareholders, on its net asset value. And it has an effect of stopping those that were even thinking about it. And secondly, it's about going after the individuals. Megan says it's the individual executives that steal and that benefit. Even if they have taken the director's indemnity insurance, we need to go after them in their personal capacity not just where the insurance is the one that comes to their rescue. That's how you hope to change the culture and create a new ethos. Lastly, it's about the people that remain behind, not just the ones that you have fired. That says we have cleaned up. And now, moving forward, we have to change not just our behavior, but the way we engage, interact, and interface with others so that at the end, we achieve ethical leadership, even though it sounds tautologous. And this notion of final accountability, one person that started this. And here we are talking about Marcus Yost, not Steinhoff. And then lastly, it's about ensuring that we have absolute transparency because in government, it's not their money, it's the public's money. In the private companies, it is the shareholders' money. But also, it is this notion of the duty of care, skill, and diligence. The one that we don't speak about is the duty of faith to make sure that as the CEO, there are no more than four critical things that you are managing. Putting people first, HSSE, and reputation management together with stakeholder management. Bronwyn. Talking about stakeholders, Fatima, you know, it is also the impact that these scenarios have on the broader health of the employees at large. So, I mean, you've got to look at mental well-being, trauma being factored in as a cost in terms of the staff complement that sits behind these large organizations that have misstepped as a result of, of individuals either turning a blind eye, etc. So perhaps just give me a sense of that cost and, and whether we really are taking that into consideration in the overall equation. Thanks, Bonwin. Um, I just want to go back to the point that Bonang made, the issue of deferred prosecution agreements. And Tim, Tim is correct that in isolation, it's not going to work. The reason why it's beneficial in a financial services con context is because from a conduct perspective, largely people are held accountable. You know, there's a very strong framework around accountability, your fiduciary duty, et cetera, that sits there and that underpins how people behave. One of the things that makes DPAs really effective is the fact that if you've been listed multiple times from an individual perspective, because people follow where people go, right? And so, so, so ultimately, the accountability sits in 
the same story seems to follow you wherever you go and and perhaps the organization should move forward with with that particular individual so the the the, the reputational aspect of how these things follow you i think the accountability rides in people ultimately start to make hiring and firing decisions based on the screening that we've done and 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 whether you're a good person to get on board or not so, so i think it is super effective but it has to be underpinned on how we solution um from a conduct perspective outside of that which is what the zonda commission report from a recommendation perspective makes multiple recommendations on what needs to be done in order to change that dial so you know when when benang talks on um about the accountability and and the consequence management that that really is super important otherwise we're just never going to 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 change the dial on where we land ultimately on on how we hold people accountable um the the, the second point that i wanted to make is how people get to that point so if you have a look at the the um fiduciary and an onerous responsibility that sits in financial services largely if you look at the um conduct that that individuals from a from a, an accounting profession signs up to if you look at at how that is structured that's exactly what um if you look at the telco industry and and IT industry that's what we're lacking so it's very fluid very loose in terms of um who you are how you get accredited etc is nothing like that sitting with with within the IT industry and and so the accountability but becomes really really difficult um to start holding people accountable if you take that up the chain um in terms of being a director um how the iod responds to these things how sica responds to these things and and the various other regulatory bodies what i believe we need to do is have a look at their mandate and 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 have a look to see whether they really have teeth on when i prescribe a set of 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 principles etc what is it that you need to do and and to be careful of of speaking people up as part of that process because the the the, the issues on on Marcus Yuster as an example and and lots of other corporate failures if you follow the 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 trend from a psychology perspective it's very very powerful individuals and and individuals that deliver for the organization from a revenue perspective and you know these people become many gods in their own right where we don't go after them because let's not have that conversation because they deliver they've written lots of revenue for the organization and we all benefit from that as um, as as a result because if we look at south africa as a whole i think the fatigue and and the lethargy of of how people feel i think a lot of us feel completely um neutralized you know just can't think for because this corruption issue seems to be everywhere and and typically when you in that high stress environment what happens is that your body just stays there and and you know producing all of this cortisol etc um and and not knowing you know the difference between whether there's a real problem here or whether i can operate normally i think as as a society we've lost our ability to to operate in a normal sense because we've we've operated in this very heightened sense of issues corruption and 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 you know th- th- that seems to be the only way of of doing business in 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 some of our segments and 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 industry and and i think those are i mean there 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 are lots of structural issues that needs to be addressed and and it ultimately is a holistic approach of how we ultimately solve solve for this issue tim let's pick up on that issue of the the regulatory bodies that we actually start going after those purported regulators that are supposed to hold to account members that misstep their professional guidelines experience as a journalist with regulatory bodies in south africa is that they sort of try um and they more or less get it wrong all the time um and you know i can't work out how that happens i mean I, the uh, things that are co- seem to be completely obvious that could be you know uh, uh, you know dealt with in weeks uh seem to take years you know and uh, you keep on we, we keep on going back to the fsca and say how is this investigation going they say oh no 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 it's going very well you know the uh, like okay um but you know in between the time that the action happened and now in america you know the the elizabeth holmes has been you know tried convicted appealed you know and served her sentence 
it's just extraordinary. It, it comes back to this capacity problems. The same sort of thing is happening in the private sector, is, hap is happening in the public sector. The, the guardrails aren't powerful enough. They don't operate fast enough. There's not enough of them. Everybody has discovered that the South African legal system is gameable. Uh, that's the essential problem. Uh, so you can game the system by using this thing called the Stalingrad strategy, which is just to appeal everything. The, the lawyers are all, you know, they're delighted at this process. Yeah, the, lawyer, the lawyers, Tim, are making money. You know, for years. One of, one of my friends said it was quite amusing. You know, the thing about Steinhoff is it's the biggest transfer of wealth from Stambosch to Johannesburg in history, just because all of the legal firms have, you know, earned so much money out of the three-year process. But for me, I think I'd, I'd like to see some action. I'd like to see consequences coming through. And I'd like if, as, as a country and as a business um, community, that we can see a renewed sense of, you know, standing for ethical business, um, standing up, people willing to stand up and talk, being courageous and, and not looking the other way. I think that's the biggest thing. I mean, and it goes back to to that um, comment, that, you know, when uh, evil prevails, when good men do nothing. And I think that's what's happened to us over the last few years. We need more people standing up, speaking out. Um, and I'd like I'd like to see the more of that um, across the business community in this coming year. The commission has some words about the regulators that were lax on money laundering. We need to remember that when we talk about state capture, we are really talking about 1.5 trillion that was stolen in the first five years. The nine wasted years, we're talking about 200 billion on average a year, every year that was siphoned off only to the two Zupta families. So it means nothing for them to spend 30 million rent on senior cancer. When the poor NPA and government on the other side, they have to reprioritize expenditure from one department to the other. It's akin to the thieves bringing an AK-47 to this war poor government bringing in a pen knife. So we all begin to die when we are silent about things that genuinely matter. Where state capture prevails and corruption is supreme, the biggest losers are labor. Because as we saw in Tinel, they are the ones who don't get their bonuses. They are the ones who go for six months without salaries. Tim, is 2022 going to be different when it comes to the headlines that we are going to be able to report on? Do you think that we are going to get to the stage where we can firmly announce that XXX has been jailed for the wrongdoing that he or she has been found guilty of doing? Do you think that, that we'll, we'll see that this year? <laughs> just to say i i really agree with uh benang and megan uh, um, but you know i'm i'm the journalist here so you know allow me to be the cynic i don't think that's going to happen uh um i wish it would but it's not i think things may get better you know, the atf atmosphere is definitely more conducive uh, to progress but i think it will be slower than people people think it's much slower than i would hope Fatima, please end this on a positive note that we're going to see a call for accountability coming to fruition as the final word on our broadcast. I almost want to have the same cynical laugh as, as, as Tim, but, you know, I also have an obligation to my children and, and, and the organization in which we serve that, you know, in, in the absence of hope, I'm not sure what we have left. Um, and, and as good corporate citizens of the country, um, I think it absolutely is an obligation to, to try and move the, 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 the dial forward. You know, we recently did a, um, a piece on, on the, the Japanese principles called um, Kintsugi, which is um, embracing your, your flaws and your imperfections, and that you can take all of those broken pieces and put it together, which makes you stronger ultimately. And, and I think it's been really rough for the country um, where we got to, um, like I said earlier on, I, th I think people really are fatigued, they're tired, um, but, but good is only going to come from from those good people that, you know, are sitting in corporates currently that get up every day, would drive their kids to school and that want to see this country land up somewhere else. 
Um, I don't want to leave. I, I only know South Africa. I've been born in bred here. This is all that I know. We have a beautiful country and, and we have really magnificent um, propositions as, as, as a country and, and we have really wonderful people. You know, so, so I'm, I'm putting my hope on, on all those wonderful and special people in our country to do what it takes in order to take it, to take it forward. These things are typically not, not easy, um, but I think the fight absolutely is worth it, so, so we must do it. Well, this is a conversation that is certainly going to be pursued here on the Nielsen Network. We're going to keep it fires burning and, and certainly make sure that uh, the story takes center stage as 2022 gains momentum. And Tim, we are going to celebrate some wins from an accountability perspective this year. Mark my words, because I know Bonang Mahali, as the president of Business Unity South Africa, is going to continue trailblazing and ensure that we hold those that need to be held to account to account. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Nielsen Network. Bonang Mahali, President of Business Unity South Africa. Tim Cohen, Editor of Business Maverick. Fatima Newman, Chief Risk Officer at EOH. And Megan Padigadgu, Chief Financial Officer of EOH. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us on this conversation.